we're now going to talk a little bit about micro and macro economic and, and trade agri policy and some concerns that are really out there on the horizon for a lot of you that are listening to this show. So a new report came out. It is by the Agri-Food Economic Systems, and the, the report is titled entitled Shifting Geopolitics and Trade Policy, Whether Canadian Agri-Food Policy. And we're joined right now by one of the co-authors, Al Mussel, based out of Guelph, Ontario. Hey, Al, how's it going? Very good, John. Thanks for having me. Yeah, so Al, uh, great uh, paper that uh, you co-authored. And, and one of the... One of the pieces that caught my attention right away was actually in, in the introductory letter, the executive summary. And here's what you said is that there is little scope for ag markets and domestic policy and trade relationships return to normal as defined by the past 20 to 25 years. Canada needs to face and adjust to this reality. Are, do you think there's enough people in ag policy circles that are as as alerted to this as maybe you are well i I guess first sean it's a a pretty stark statement and um uh if quite frankly i hope we're wrong um but but the signs which um which have turned really pretty suddenly on this they don't point toward any uh, any particular optimism and because things have changed in, in in my understanding of it at least so quickly you know, there, there probably aren't many people on, on you know, the, the government policy side or, or within um, farm organizations that, that may be picking up on this. But and, and, and part of the reason for uh, for putting together this policy, you know, is to sort of help people understand uh, we need to appreciate the breadth and depth of change that's coming toward us as a small country. OK, so I guess. How did how did we get to this point? I think a lot of people would probably uh, point right away to well, it's it's the growth of populism. Is, is it that simple? Um, no, I think there's I think there's more issues to it. And, and um, um, l- let me let me start with something that's been brewing for a long time, um, and and that's the issue um, between Western countries, not just the United States. Uh, it could because it includes Canada and Western Europe and, and others uh, with China. So China acceded to the WTO in, I believe, 2001 or thereabouts. And and I think we all thought that, um, well, you know, they, they, they wanted to have levels of economic development like the Western world did and so on. So they would be prepared to take on institutions like the Western world would. Or, or Western world does, and uh, you know, for example, give up some of its uh, means of control and planned economic development, and so on. And and of course, that's turned out to be completely false. You know, what what we have in China is basically an authoritarian country that tolerates markets. So you know, markets and private companies are maybe you know up to fifty percent of the economy, but but the rest of it is is under state control in one fashion or or other. So not too long after uh, China exceeded the WTO, uh, we started to run into issues of uh, implicit subsidy, um, uh, control of state-owned enterprises, um, and, and kind of um, discrimination among um, uh, supplier countries and importers. Uh, some of the other issues that have been raised around intellectual property, et cetera, they came up almost right away. Um so that's been brewing along for quite some time. Now, now when you mentioned the rise of populism, um, President Trump campaigned on getting tough with China, and, and this U.S. administration has taken a particular style and approach to it that, um, that you know, I guess it's brought things to a head. But, uh, but so far what it's done is it's, it's really just emboldened both sides to dig their heels in. We haven't got anything resolved. Yeah. Um, now the the so that that's that's been brewing for quite some time, along with some some pretty deep concerns that the U.S. has with the direction in which the WTO has been been heading, and and we can touch on that. But but I don't want to lose sight of the fact that the real proximate cause of where we're at in ag and food is this what do you, what do you want to call it? biological disaster, which is African swine fever in China and now spread throughout Eastern Asia. Uh, you wouldn't have a lot of the fallout and ramifications going through the crop side 
uh, particularly on soybeans. And then, of course, canola becomes collateral damage to that, uh, apart from some of the other issues we have around canola. Uh, if you didn't have African swine fever, because this is just simply a, you know, it's it's like an Old Testament level event. So the majority of Canada, can, or sorry, the majority of Canada's ag economy is very, very export reliant. We're we're trying to change that. You know, we've been increasing domestic processing of canola and uh, recently pulses. How do, how does the Canadian ag ag exporters how do how do we adjust? How do, how does this whole sector sort of uh, make sure that we're shoehorning ourselves into the new reality? Well, it, well, it's tough. Uh, so, the, so the first thing is, uh, yeah, I mean, particularly if you look at Western Canada, you know, a- almost anything that is not supply managed, it depends on uh, export market access. That's almost as good as access uh, would be within the domestic market. Otherwise, we can't leverage our scale and we can't get efficient level of investments. Um, you can't rationally attract them. So, so, so that that's a that's a huge problem for us, and that's why we need that market access. And as we begin to chip away at this, uh, that that's a, that's a very scary reality for us. But secondly, you know, really, regardless of whether you're talking about um, a, a real big export orientation as opposed to more of a domestic orientation, but open to trade and arbitrage and referencing U.S. futures markets. So, uh, you know, think about. Uh, uh, corn, uh, soybeans, a uh, number of other grain crops, where we may not be huge exporters, but we depend on price discovery mechanisms out of the United States and, and elsewhere. Um, as, as, our, as our trade environment begins to devolve, you get more and more protection coming in. Those mechanisms are less and less of use to us. And this just, it just all adds uncertainty. And, you know, we're 20 to 25 years into taking these kinds of things for granted. So it, it really causes us to go back. I, I think it should cause us to go back and start, uh, you know, pull out the drawing board and, and, and think about what we can do. And it's a fundamental change, right? So as we see these increasing tariffs globally and we see more protectionism and, you know, more a sense of countries promoting buying uh, from domestically produced production, in some ironic twist here, is, are, are, is the Canadian supply management sector, is it actually the most well-positioned for this, this new reality in some odd, ironic way? Um, I'm sure that's probably the conventional wisdom. I, I think the right answer is we don't know yet, Sean. And one of the things I worry about is, and I'm, and I'm, and I'm frankly, I'm just I'm thinking about this new U.S.-Japan trade agreement, and you look at how that based on what we know publicly, at least, how that appears to have rolled out was uh, the U.S. went back to Japan. And they said, okay, we need the same access that we would have gotten under WTO or better for ag products. And we also need to deal fairly quickly with intellectual property and, and a few other issues. So uh, you're going to give us that. Otherwise, the auto tariffs are coming. Hope you like it. In other words, they just, they just came in and, and, and threatened Japan with the auto tariffs unless they gave them this. Um, by, by the way, if anybody were inclined to challenge us under WTO, there, there's probably two modes of, um, of attack which would render this um, probably illegal. I doubt if anybody's seriously going to challenge it, however. But go back now to your question about supply managed industries. What's to stop the U.S. from coming in and saying, okay, um, uh, how's this sound? Softwood lumber for dairy. And if you're not prepared to do that, then we're just, we're just going to quit buying softwood lumber from you hope you like that well what would we do and in the past when we had protections of a rules-based uh, trading environment that was completely offside but we, uh, th- thinking about u.s japan as a precedent that that seems um altogether possible today so so i i, I think the first line of defense is you know yeah supply management comes out of this better than some of the more market-oriented uh, commodities but I don't think anybody walks away safe out of this environment. We've seen you mentioned rules-based trade, and we've heard foreign rela- or foreign affairs minister Christia Freeland talk a lot about rules-based system, and, uh, and especially as it applies to some of the trade negotiations that have been going on. You mentioned the WTO and some of the the challenges there. How how does a country? You know, I don't want to sound like a doomsdayer, but you know, realistically, how does a country of only thirty eight million people and the size of our economy that's so export reliant? 
how does it function where the rules are a little bit more flexible than maybe would work to our advantage? How, how do, how do we, how do we have success in this environment? Well, that, 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 that that's exactly, uh, you, you pretty much scoped out the risk that we faced that, you know, even 18 months ago, uh, certainly I wasn't thinking in this way. And I, and I doubt if anybody was, you know, we, we very much, um, you know, we're, we're 20 to 25 years into, a mantra that um, freer markets, open trade, are good for Canadian ag and food, and 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 that that has been true. But but now we fairly quickly have to start thinking about okay, well if that's not going to work for us, then then what? Mm-hmm. So so yeah, I mean we're we're a small country. We we don't have the economic weight of the U.S., China, EU, uh, India, countries like that. So so. What do we have to bring to bear? Well, you know, the first thing we do is is we try and figure out what sort of a rules basis that we can salvage out of this. So, so Canada has been a leader in um, attempting to revive the WTO as a feasible uh, institution, and 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 you know, I think I think we're that effort's ongoing, and and hopefully that can lead to something. Uh, another option is to look for coalitions of countries. Um, maybe middle-sized countries. So, you know, we do have some alignment with uh, Australia, New Zealand, um, perhaps some of the South American countries, although they're quickly being taken over by China economically. Um, you know, maybe places like South Africa, um, you know, the, the UK post-Brexit, whatever that ends up looking like. Maybe there's a group of middle-sized countries that we can, that we can work with that, um, that we deal with in terms of secure access. Now, one thing that Canada does have some weight in is food, is ag and food. Um, and, and you know, I made reference earlier to African swine fever in China and, and, and now throughout East Asia as being, you know, th- this is, I mean, this could be a decade long event and very serious, like nothing we've ever seen. So, you know, you could have uh, shortages of protein to the level uh, in that part of the world that that actually if we if we understand that situation and can be seen as a solutions provider to them that that it really could carry some weight so so we start to explore um sort of specific uh, options rather than rather than this idea that um you know we've we've got secure market access and a commodity stream that we can just sell our product into somewhat reliably now now i have I had numerous discussions about you know Canada's kind of long term plan with with you know several people from different think tanks and, and researchers, and the common thread here is we really seem to lack a bit of a long term motivation for a plan, and and I I really wonder as if I look at this election, we're kind of seeing that real the evidence of that clearly is that. We don't really seem to be focused on, you know, that that big Canadian plan uh, for the for the economy and everything that kind of goes under that that umbrella. W- would you, would you agree with that? Yeah, I, I I agree that we certainly haven't seen that forthcoming. Um, we 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 probably need to get there. Um, you know, our 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 timing uh, is not great. You know, so with, with, within ag and food, we, we do have a little bit of a problem. I think the, um, well, I'll, I'll just deal on the support side. So we have a commitment of support to supply managed industries in, in, uh, in consideration of recent trade agreements, which I think was probably ill-timed, you know, given that we now have to confront um, a, a range of issues on the more market-oriented uh, commodities. So, you know, surely canola, and uh, some pulse crops are, are lining up and, and thinking about the hurt that they're under. And, and they probably feel like they didn't get the kind of support that dairy did. Uh, I'm sure soybeans are probably there as well. Uh, on the livestock side, you know, we've been sitting here thinking about African swine fever for more than a year. And, and you know, the expectations are going to be mass shortages of protein. And there will, but that still hasn't come. And in the intervening period, I mean, we've we've we're, we're talking about some pretty serious losses in uh, hog production and and beef production. Yeah. Um, so so that's been a bit of a divisive matter. Um, and and you know, I guess I guess I deal in ag and food more so than the broader economy, but I'm sure it plays it across the broader economy as well. 
on energy in particular, I would think. Yeah, there's some in, in this time where there's so much focus on trade distortion and trying to change the balance of trade and so much focused on surpluses versus deficits when most economists would say that that number really doesn't matter. Um, there's so much focus on tariffs, okay? And so, you know, tariffs being applied, tariffs being pulled back. But I think one of the pieces that isn't getting enough discussion is the egg subsidy side of it. We've seen two mm -hmm. rounds of uh, MRP payments in, in the U.S. We've got the U.K. talking about a post-hard uh, Brexit uh, payment to farmers. Uh, obviously, Europe, the EU is famous for its level of ag subsidy. Uh, Canada has its own versions of that. As those escalate and, and we, those, those values become higher and higher, governments trying to support uh, local farmers in, in, or domestic farmers, uh, how that that can very much be that is so market distorting it, and the effects are very very long term yeah so so the the, the problem you have with um with subsidy is um when 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 you, when you start to get into this um it it spreads so uh, you know again we 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 compete with the US for basic farm inputs fertilizer uh uh, pesticides, fuel, et cetera. And, you know, when, when they've got a big subsidy check to back their demand and we don't, well, then, then uh, some of that kind of product will end up going south. So, so we, we can't stay clear of this. It's, it's at least, well, whether you want to think of it as having uh, you know, backbone or resolve or just impoverishing your own people, like it, it's pretty hard for us to stay out of it. And I doubt if we can stay out of it, even though we know this is not the, not the right way to proceed. So that's the first thing. We've got to get into it. However, secondly, we don't have the treasury that the U.S. does. So this is this could never be a winner for us. So we're, you know, what, that's another way of saying we probably need to participate in a losing battle. And third, we know the effects that this brings. We know what's going to happen. It will lower global prices. And the reason it will do that is, so look at your MFP um, payments thus far. The ones in 2018 were fragmented across crops and um, highly oriented towards uh, soybeans in the Midwest. The second round are per acre payments fragmented by county. But you know, if you're a recipient of these payments, I, I think you're looking at this and you're saying, well, okay, I, I have to assume that we may be going into a downward spiral of farm prices. So there may be payments like this again in the future. So what I want to do is I want to make sure I don't change anything because I know what the basis for the payments were in the past. So I don't want to change my crop mix any. Even if the marketplace is saying, as it, as it will be, grow far fewer soybeans, I don't. I, I doubt if we're going to see much. I mean, maybe a little bit, but you know, I think most people are going to say, "Well, you know, I'm going to I'm going to stick with what I know, what got me those payments." And secondly, I don't want to mess up my crop rotation too much, so they won't. Is that where Western Canada, as an example, might have the most ability to be flexible here because people are very, very willing to grow an assortment of crops, not just silly two. Well, you know, and, and, and it's and it's been a it's it's been a great success for us, I think. You know, painful at first, I'm sure, but uh, but but it has been a great success for us. And um, and and uh, I think relative to the U.S. Midwest, where increasingly they're into a two crop rotation, which you know, there's probably a bunch of uh, whatever you want to call it, agronomic or, or sustainability uh, questions you can ask about the uh, the wisdom of that, but. But yeah, Western Canada is in a, in, a, in a better situation there. You know, in, in Eastern Canada, I think the situation is maybe a little bit different. Um, there, there's all sorts of things that we can grow in, in Eastern Canada. But the problem is we've got land values that are driving us to you know, tend to maximize the value per acre, which, which draws us into that Midwestern U.S. rotation, which is corn and soybeans, and then with, with winter wheat, it's kind of the weak sister of it. Well, now if we have to go in and, and look at this, as as, uh, as somebody from the green trade told me the other day, in, in Ontario this year we had 3 million acres of soybeans, and we probably only needed two. So what are we going to do with that million acres? So are we going to grow oats and barley? We can grow oats and barley, sure, but it doesn't really fit with, uh, you know, ten thousand dollar an acre plus plus land values. So how exactly do we handle that? 
Interesting stuff. Uh, we're, t we're talking to Al Muscle. He is co-author of the paper, Shifting Geopolitics and Trade Policy, Wither Canadian Agri-Food Policy. Hey, Al, this has been great chatting with you. We've got to do it again uh, sometime very soon. For sure. Glad, glad to do it, Sean. Great thoughts and discussion there with Al Muscle. I encourage you to check out the full report. It's about 12 pages. You can find the link to the report at realagriculture.com. I'll make sure I post it on our website.